design architecture. By the time you get to where I am, everybody's smart. So you're not that smart. So all the smart people are now in my letters. So a few people are really, uh, I call them originals. So there's a number. But even fewer than that are the forces of nature. Of which there are two or three. Randall Allen is one. He is just a way that certainly is the force of nature. She is unbelievably Thank you very much for your invitation to, to be here. I'm really happy to come back to Ohio. Of course, the first person that invited me to this place many, many years ago uh, was... Uh, why not? <laughs> oh, well, yes. I mean, it makes us all very old, right? Oh, we were very young then, which is true also, so both. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the last projects that I have been working on, on Playboy uh, architecture. It's part of one of these uh, uh, research, collaborative research projects that I have been uh, conducting with uh, PhD students uh, at Princeton as part of, of a kind of a pedagogical experiment uh, to try to uh, have students in the, in the first year uh, work collaboratively on uh, on the research of uh, of something, preferably something I have no idea and they don't have any idea. So we both uh, uh, we all learn learn at the same uh, time. And uh, you are already familiar, and I saw the poster has the the clip stand fall and other projects because it's very important to me that these projects materialize uh, in some form in an exhibition, in a book, in a film, uh, etc. Uh, and this one uh, is, uh, is part of this uh, series. 
uh, in, and the idea is uh, to look at uh, uh, architecture in Playboy uh, uh, magazine. So it was, the whole research was developed in collaboration with several PhD students, including Britt Eversol, Federica Banucci, Marco Handworker, and Pepe Aviles. With these four, um, I put together also the exhibition that opened in Maastricht in the Netherlands in September and closed uh, uh, last February. Um, and is traveling now to uh, uh, Sao Paulo, actually, to the, to the uh, Biennale of Sao Paulo. Um, in, apart from these people that collaborated in the exhibition, there were a number of other students that were also involved in, in the research, including uh, Mark Briz, Daria Ricci, Daniela Fabricios, uh, uh, Enrique Ramirez, Molly Stensen, Jetun de Olaye, Vanessa Grossman, uh, and so that's our team, right? And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sometimes often, uh, sometimes ask uh, why it is that uh, kind of research university like Princeton will be uh, interested in, in Playboy. Uh, and, and indeed, you have to have looked, uh, to have seen the face of the, or the look in the face of the librarians that fall when they ask me what did I need for the reading material in my course. And I tell them to buy them the entire run of uh, Playboy starting in 53, which is the very <laughs> beginning of the, of the magazine to, um, to 1979. And, and, you know, I have to repeat the request like three times because it didn't kind of uh, uh, get, uh, kind of, uh, it didn't uh, materialize. And finally, they, they bought this, uh, these magazines. And then the second problem is uh, they felt uncomfortable about keeping the magazines in the library. So another kind of sequence of... Uh, comic uh, uh, exchanges took place where the librarian said that they could possibly not keep the, they couldn't possibly keep the, the playboys in the library and say, why is that? You know, they were afraid that the students will use it in the wrong way. And I say, well, you know, have you heard about the internet? Because, you know, there is a lot more, <laughs> more uh, racist stuff in the internet and this is actually pretty lame. But anyway, to make the story short, we had to keep the, the Playboys in the PhD room where the PhDs work, etc., because they wouldn't allow them in, in, the, in the library. That, of course, facilitated enormously our research because we, could, we had them there. We didn't have to go up and check them out or do any of those things. In the meantime, a new librarian arrived who is very enlightened and knows the value of, uh, of Playboy and now did something in, which makes the whole thing much more difficult. She put them in... Uh, in rare, uh, <laughs> so now you have to make an appointment, you have to wear gloves, you have to go in a particular, which is a lot more kinky, of course, you have to go in a particular room. And you, so there was never a normal moment in which uh, uh, the magazines were in the library. They were either uh, handed down to us or, or, um, or we have to put gloves on. In any case, the research, as I say, started with kind of a dumb realization, the, the, the almost very simple realization that there was a lot of architecture in Playboy uh, magazine. That's why I have this idea to look at, uh, uh, at, uh, at, magazine, at, at this magazine. And the exhibition is the, the result of at least four years of uh, research, uh, 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 seminars, workshops in preparation for the exhibition, designing the exhibition, uh, uh, etc. Um, if there was a joke in the 1950s that, uh, that uh, people read Playboy uh, for the articles. Uh, it is indeed uh, uh, the case when you look at the, uh, at the magazine that the magazine is extraordinary, right? So you have articles by anybody you can, you can imagine. They have interviews with Marshall uh, McLuhan, with Jean Paul Sartre, Salvador Dali, even they get political, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Fidel Castro. Uh, you read great writers, for example, Ray Bradbury was serialized, Fahrenheit 451 was serialized in Playboy before uh, it was uh, published. You have Alan Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and the big, big generation, John Updike, Updike uh, Doris Lessing, Joyce Carol Oates, Hemingway, Italo Calvino, Henry Miller, Carl Barnegat, I mean, you name it. Any writer that you can think of in that period is in Playboy magazine, and in fact, Playboy has been taken very seriously uh, in other departments at universities, right, in the Department of Literature, etc. But in architecture, we have ignored. We didn't even seem to realize that there was so much architecture in the, uh, in the, in the magazine. Umberto Eco uh, wrote uh, uh, about Playboy, but nobody uh, paid any attention to the fact that there was so much 
architecture in Playboy. So from the very beginning, you find yourself that the magazine is covering, of course, they are in Chicago, so they start with Frank Joe Wright and Miss Van der Rohe, but then move to the, uh, through the whole kind of mid-50s generation of uh, Charles uh, uh, Eames, uh, uh, and Charles Andre Eames, Nelson, Bertoya, uh, etc., to practically then echo all the developments of the 60s and, and 70s, uh, from Charles Moore uh, to Anne Farm, Bucky Fuller, Paolo Soleri, uh, Moses Safdie, etc. The interest of uh, uh, Playboy for architecture and design is actually already um, evident in the very first issue with Marilyn Monroe uh, on the cover and the promise of her naked uh, body inside. The editorial of that very first issue uh, opens with a cartoon uh, which is all about the interior, and I will talk about this uh, cartoon uh, in a minute. But uh, very important before uh, we continue is to establish uh, three points. One, that is architecture and sexuality are inseparable from the beginning in uh, Playboy. Second, that architecture is not something covered uh, in the magazine like literature or politics, but is integral uh, to it. Uh, that is, the sexual fantasies and the architectural fantasies are inseparable. And third, that Playboy uh, can't exist without architecture. Moreover, as I said, this architecture is all uh, about the interior. The Playboy is an indoors uh, man. As the first editorial uh, already says, we don't mind, they say, telling you in advance that we plan on spending most of our time inside. We like our apartments. We enjoy uh, mixing cocktails and an hors d'oeuvre or two putting a little mute music on the phonograph, I'm invi inviting a female acquaintance for a quiet discussion on me, on, sorry, on Picasso, Nietzsche, jazz, or sex, right? So this is a cultivated man that spends all this time in the interior and can have a conversation about Picasso, Nietzsche, jazz, or sex. So the playboy is clearly an indoors man, but you may want to uh, ask why uh, we don't mind telling you in advance what is there to mind. The editorial in that sense is also uh, very clear. Most uh, magazines for men, uh, they write, um, spend all their time outdoors thrashing through thorny thickets or splashing about in fast-flowing uh, streams. The playboy is clearly a different kind of animal. He's also a hunter but the metropolitan apartment, as you will see, is his natural habitat. He knows everything about this apartment and keeps adjusting it to better catch his prey. In fact, as you will see, he cares much more about the lure than about the catch. It is the apartment itself that is the ultimate object of desire. The Playboy and his magazines are all about architecture. This philosophy is, of course, embodied in the figure of Hefner uh, himself, who famously almost uh, never left his bed, let alone his house. He literally moved uh, the office into his bed in 1960 when he moved into the Playboy uh, Mansion in uh, North State uh, Parkway in Chicago, turning into the epicenter of a global empire and his silk pajamas and his dressing gown into kind of his business attire. Here you have him in bed, you know, with all these candy bars and candy apples and really working uh, very hard. It's also funny to look at the photographs of, of Hefner when he was still in an office, eh, before he moved into the mansion, and you already see that he's always on the floor, so he's already using the carpet as a, as a floor. He also kept saying that he moved into, into the mansion, he moved the office into the house because he was almost like any, any architect, spending all his time uh, in the office, eating in the office, sleeping in the office, and that reminded me, of course, of all these architects, including Sejima. I visited Sejima, in, uh, you know, who famously also never leaves her office a few years ago. And, you know, you are there talking with her and seeing the models, and then you see Sus over there and a coat over there, and you realize she's there, sleeping under a little, in a coat under a little bit. So this, uh, the same thing for, for uh, uh, Hefner. He moved because he was spending all his time in the office, but I also like the idea that he moved from uh, using this, uh, this floor uh, as the surface of his work, which is a simple step then 
to move into the mansion and start working on this uh, space of the, of the bed. I don't go out of the house at all. Uh, I'm a contemporary recluse, he told uh, Tom Wolf, uh, who have come to interview him, guessing that the last time he had been out of the house had been three and a half months before. And, it, and in the last uh, two years, he guessed he had been out of the house maybe only nine times. Fascinated, uh, Tom Wolf described him as the tender, timpani, green heart of an artichoke. Even when uh, Hefner went out, he was not really out at all, but wrapped in a succession of bubbles, uh, all designed to extend uh, his interior. So we are talking really about unextended uh, interiors. That's why I call it the, the total interior, this infinite interior that starts with the, the, the bed and, and, and the mansion and moves into all these other vehicles, specifically designed, uh, specially designed uh, or outfitted for, for uh, him. Uh, uh, the most interesting one is probably this one, the Big Bunny, which is a jet stretch DC-9 designed by Ron D. Smith. By the way, Ron D. Smith was the architect, is the architect of the mansion, and it included a gourmet kitchen, uh, a dancing floor, a living room, conference space, a discotheque, a wet bar, a state-of-the-art cinemascope projectors, a sleeping quarters for 16 guests, and Hefner's suite with a shower and an elliptical bed covered in Tasmanian opossum skins. And here is the, the suite of Hefner with the elliptical bed and the shower and all of this and all this other space. And here is the, uh, the Tasmanian opossum uh, skins. And here is uh, Hefner arriving in Heathrow with his then uh, girlfriend, uh, uh, Barbie. And what I like about these photographs too is that you see Barbie is like totally relaxed there, right? She's in her element. And he's already, Hefner is a little bit more tense, right? Like this is a round bed, but it's an or elliptical bed, but it's not my mansion anymore. So he is uncomfortable outside of his, uh, of his place. Apart from the vehicles, of course, you can think about the home away from home of the Playboy uh, clubs. Here is the car of Hugh Hefner, number one member of these VIP clubs, which started with the Playboy uh, club in Chicago in 1960 and rapidly uh, uh, growing from seven Playboy clubs in 1963 uh, to 17 by 1965 and ultimately 33. Here is the Playboy club in New York or the Playboy club in Miami or in New Orleans. Oh, and here is Hefner which I like this photograph a lot too because it's Hefner photograph uh, as if he was himself an architect with the pipe and the model of his LA uh, Playboy club that was never, uh, never realized. Not only is he fascinated by architecture, but he seems to kind of uh, uh, absorb, the, embody the figure of the architect in this, uh, in this picture. So Playboy, in other words, is produced in a radical interior and is devoted uh, to the interior uh, devoted uh, like a lover. The magazine was filled with the interiors from the very first uh, issue. No detail of domestic space is left untouched, from the furniture to the lighting, the hi-fi, the dress code. Of course, they also recommend the kinds of things that you should buy. This is also very much part of the magazine. Uh, the hi-fi is very, very important. The, the shoes, uh, the dressing gowns, of course, extremely uh, important to uh, the mixing of a good martini. The first page of the, of the first issue of the magazine facing the editorial shows this cartoon that you already saw of this proud uh, playboy, a male bunny uh, at home in his pyjamas and bathrobe, standing beside his modern furniture of which you can uh, immediately see the hard oil, uh, uh, butterfly uh, chair of 1940, which became a signature piece in the Playboy interior, it's always in Playboy, it's either uh, playmates uh, uh, using the, uh, the chair or it appears in all the, uh, the interiors of, of Playboy. In fact, it seems to act like kind of a portable uh, home uh, for playmates, as you can see uh, in these uh, uh, pictures. Already in the uh, second issue of the magazine, 
a feature or naked uh, playmate basically keeps describing, uh, instead of talking about the playmates, they don't say anything about the playmates, but it keeps describing in excruciating detail the modern design flooring and furnishing of the California ranch style house these models are photographing. Some say you can judge a man, a man by the way he furnished his home. The article is automatically begun in what will become a kind of mantra in the magazine. Design is, key, is the key to the Playboy lifestyle. Frank Joe Wright and uh, Ballas uh, Harrison are praised also in the fourth issue for bringing modern design to the house and the skyscraper. And they write about, uh, Playboy writes about the exciting simplicity of uh, uh, modern architecture, which obviously stimulates uh, Playboy. Playboy, uh, uh, the role of, of, uh, of design in Playboy uh, becomes even more clear when in the next issue they provide a guide to the 25 steps necessary for a successful context. And the sequence, as you can see, is mapped uh, in a modern apartment as if the layout and the equipment uh, itself choreograph this dance of seduction. I mean, one could compare it with these uh, uh, diagrams of uh, uh, functional uh, uh, apartments in the, in the 20s. It's very, very non-functional. So as the uh, uh, playboy maneuvers his prey towards the bed, each detail of the apartment assist, assist in this movement. It's not by chance, of course, that the journey starts with the kind of uh, um, uh, lightweight curves of the butterfly chair and the deep sensuous uh, folds of Eros Arinen's 1946 warm chair, which is, by the way, another signature chair in Playboy, which appears many times in the covers or playmates lounging in, in, in Saarinen uh, uh, chairs. It is, in a way, as if the designers are in the room assisting uh, in the seduction. The Playboy apartment is in the end a cocktail of modern design, martinis, and music. Far from simply providing an array of seductive images, Playboy analyzes the architecture of seduction. It offers a kind of user manual uh, to the reader. And in the end, the sophisticated Playboy needs to know much more, as you will see, about modern design than about women. There are no articles about uh, the psychology of women or what you have to do to get them in bed. That, that doesn't seem to be of interest, but you definitely need modern architecture and design to accomplish uh, uh, this task. Everything uh, in, uh, uh, well, this is interesting because how informed and how sophisticated Hefner is, I think is demonstrated by this image of uh, early publication of one of the apartments in Lakeshore Drive apartments of, of Chicago, right? I would have expected being a Miss apartment that it would have been furnished with, uh, I don't know, Barcelona chairs or, or Miss furniture, but already you see in these early photographs that they have precisely the Sarinian chair and the uh, butterfly uh, chair. So obviously Hefner is looking at architectural magazines and is very well informed uh, about uh, architecture and design. In any case, everything in Playboy is seen through the lens uh, of design. Even a spoof on, on, on psychoanalysis offers a detailed drawing of the couch and the plan of the room. Likewise, the movements of the furniture on the left is, is broken down, as are the precise uh, uh, movements of the martini production. So Playboy relentlessly dissects each dimension of the interior. This dedication to the perfected interior culminates in the September 1956, uh, uh, October 1956. Look at, uh, you know, the covers, how kind of innocent are, are these covers of September uh, or October, which is when uh, uh, Playboy designed the Playboy penthouse. The pen Playboy penthouse was the first Playboy uh, design apartment uh, that was lavishly um, illustrated in an eight-page uh, spread, longer than any typical feature in Playboy, and continue with another six page, pages in the following uh, issue. Uh, rejecting the convention in which they say that the overwhelming percentage of home is furnished by women, the point was to create an interior that is unambiguously masculine with equipment that stays and women that come and go. They write, a man yearns for quarters of his own, more than a place to hang his hat, a man dreams of his own domain, a place that is exclusively his. Playboy has designed, planned, and decorated from the floor up 
a penthouse apartment for the urban uh, bachelor. Now, these atmospheric kind of renderings, uh, as you can see, conjure up a, a, a continuous landscape of entertainment. Each successive space is described in great detail with all the individual items uh, uh, separately identified, including the designer, the name of the piece, how much it costs, uh, what is the name, etc., where you can find it, uh, etc. The house is also full. This is the kitchen, also very modern. Um, the, and this continues in October uh, of 56, continue the apartment, they keep identifying these things, the Noguchi table, the Ims uh, uh, chair, uh, etc. The house is also full of the latest electronics uh, uh, and media. A signature piece is the, uh, what they call the electronic entertainment center, which has hi-fi, FM, radio, TV, tape recorded, movie, and slide projectors. The entire environment can be also controlled from the, from the bed, which is the epicenter of this idealized interior. The imagine, imagine occupant driver of the space is, of course, in the end, the reader. In a canny seduction, the magazine describes the most advanced interior architecture design for a man, perhaps very much like you, the reader, or that is the reader's fantasy, is the client and is offered the keys to the apartment in the very first page of the article, right? With the, with the plan, you already have uh, the keys. Um, architecture turns out to be, uh, uh, as you will see, more seductive than the playmates. Uh, the penthouse uh, feature, this feature, turned out to be most popular, uh, the most popular feature in the magazine's uh, history, surpassing even the centerfold. So uh, in, uh, this is the third year of the magazine, and they never received so many uh, letters praising the house, trying to find more information about where you can buy that piece of furniture, whether you can reproduce this, uh, this house somewhere else, etc. So they never received so many letters or so much interest by any of the women represented in the, in the center fold. So architecture, you can argue, becomes the ultimate playmate, the only one really allowed to stay. Playboy receives uh, all these uh, letters requesting more information on the house, asking for more detailed plans and where to buy the furniture. In response, the magazine started a hugely popular uh, series of features on uh, Playboy paths that include the weekend uh, hideaway here of 1959, the Playboy uh, Townhouse, this is a very beautiful, actually, uh, project that was originally commissioned as Hefner uh, House, but they didn't get uh, passed by the Landmark Commission because it's a very uh, kind of classy part of the neighborhood. It's, it's almost like a Paul Rudolph uh, house with this, uh, also this incredible pool, a bit like uh, the Josephine Baker uh, house in the sense that from uh, all the different levels you can look into, into this, uh, 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 this pool. And again, uh, uh, with in identifying all the pieces of, of furniture, F for the first time you see the round bed in this apartment, and again they identify all the little, p all the pieces and, and 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 what you can find. And again, they receive an enormous amount of uh, letters, most of them incredibly uh, uh, positive, uh, admiring, wonderful taste, elegant, etc., etc., of this project, asking for more information. Uh, now and then you find one that is not so positive, like this one says, you are Playboy Townhouse. It's a wonderful, a sleek collection of architectonic cliches, but hardly architecture by a Sandy Jorgensen of Miami, Florida, who don't, we don't know who uh, he or she is. But look at who wrote instead. Eh? Neutra wrote this long, long, elaborate letter admiring the house in great detail, practically uh, uh, offering himself to do one of these uh, uh, Playboy paths, which demonstrates that not only he's uh, uh, reading Playboy, he goes out of his way to say how much he's enjoying uh, Playboy, but admires very much uh, 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 this house, and is one of those, uh, uh, of, of, of the majority of architects that were really uh, interested in Playboy uh, magazine. The series continues also with the Playboy patio terrace of 1963, where basically they turn the outside into an inside, uh, the Playboy uh, duplex penthouse of 1970. Uh, here you have some renderings of, of this, where for some reason they return to the rectangular bed in this, uh, in this project. 
uh, media equipment is always given uh, a special attention, uh, uh, but in any case, uh, the fantasy is always the same. The bachelor and the equipment are able to control every aspect of the interior environment to choreograph the successful conquest and subsequent erasure of all the traces in preparation uh, for the next uh, capture. And media also contributes enormously uh, to this uh, end. They talk about the electronic uh, wall, but they also talk about the Playboy's uh, wonder wall that you have uh, uh, here. Several students in my class were fascinated by this uh, Playboy wonder wall, like, uh, uh, and they did papers on this, and somebody else was looking into surveillance. Surveillance is very important in the, uh, uh, in the Playboy uh, wall, and here you have Hefner in the mansion. With, so it's almost like a big brother house with this kind of wall of screens where Hefner can control what is happening in all the spaces of the, of the mansion. But Playboy architecture ultimately turns on the bed, which becomes increasingly sophisticated, outfitted with all kinds of uh, entertainment and communication devices as a kind of control uh, room. The magazine devoted a number of articles to the design of this per perfect bed, and once again, Hefner acted as the model with his famous round bed, introduced as a feature that you saw before in the Playboy townhouse of 1962, originally commissioned to be his own house, and then installed in his Playboy mansion. It is actually not, not by chance uh, that the only piece of the townhouse to be uh, finally uh, realized was the, uh, the bed. The bed itself, you can argue, is the house, right? It's rotating, vibrating a structure. It's packed with, listen to this, fridge, hi-fi, telephone, filing cabinets, bar, microphone, dictaphone, video cameras, headphones, television, breakfast table, working surfaces, control for all the lighting fixtures, of course, for the man who never wants to leave. The bed was literally uh, Hefner's office, his place of business, where he conducted interviews, made his phone calls, selected images, adjusted layouts, edited tests, ate, drank, and uh, consulted uh, with Playmates. So if Playboy is uh, all about architecture, this architecture is an extension of the bed. The, bed. the Playboy interior is finally all bed. Playboy uh, made it acceptable for men uh, to be in, and this is actually some uh, <laughs> Hefner uh, working on some of the, and, and here you can see some of the issues that are uh, important uh, uh, to, uh, to Playboy in, those, uh, in this moment. Playboy, in any case, uh, made it acceptable uh, for men uh, to be interested in modern architecture and design. Readers were encouraged to think they could have a piece of uh, an idealized uh, interior in their own uh, life. This is, of course, also reinforced in all the advertisements uh, in the magazine. There are many ways in which this is reinforced. For example, here you have uh, an advertisement for uh, slacks, uh, that are unbrinkable slacks on a, on a, on a Miss Van der Rohe uh, chair. In any case, what uh, Playboy is doing is kind of creating or building up this uh, cycle uh, of desire that keeps feeding the fantasy with more and more details about this object. And these objects are, of course, by the most sophisticated designers of the day. Uh, from me, we move, as we say before, to all the kind of 1950s uh, generation of uh, uh, Bertoia, Nelson, Charles Im, Eros Aerinen, but also uh, things like this, Alan Gold, or again, uh, Saarinen, all these fantastic uh, lamps, uh, Italian uh, uh, lamps from the 70s, golf equipment, uh, even the Miss uh, uh, Le Corbusier says uh, 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 long is, uh, is uh, recommended, uh, and even uh, things like the uh, Roberto Mata Malite uh, chair, uh, Archithum uh, chairs. This was uh, actually an article that appeared in Playboy uh, a few weeks after um, uh, the Museum of Modern Art opened the new domestic landscape exhibition, where uh, pieces like this, the the Robert, Roberto Mata, the father of Mata Clark, uh, Malite chair was presented, or the Archithum Miss chair on the, uh, on the right. Uh, again, uh, even inflatables, uh, the Colombo uh, cabinets, they recommend you which kind of typewriter you can have. Of course, they have really great taste. I mean, I wish somebody had recommended me to buy those things. I mean, and we end up 
basically at the end of the uh, uh, 70s and they already recommended you that you buy the Frank Gehry uh, cardboard chair. I mean, you have to understand that at that point you could buy that chair or, or one of those cardboard chairs of Frank Gehry in blooming days for $37. So Playboy was really doing you a great favor. We're telling you go and buy it, right? Because, you know, you can now have a piece that is worth thousands of dollars. It, it's, it's kind of incredible. I was once in uh, Cornell and, uh, and I was trying to think about this and I made some joke about Playboy doing more for modern architecture and design in this country than any other kind of institution, the Museum of Modern Art. Or, and then a woman came at the end and she says, now I understand this great collection of furniture that my father has, my father who had never had any interest in art, in architecture, <laughs> or anything like that. She has the most exotic collection of chairs that I always say, I've got to get these chairs uh, for myself, because he was studying uh, architecture. And so she asked his father, why, why do you have all this, this stuff? He said, Playboy told me to buy it, right? <laughs> so there. Um, if you think that the design, and, and you are correct, that the design uh, is more sophisticated uh, than the architecture, eventually uh, Playboy uh, architecture caught up with the, uh, with the furniture and the somewhat kind of generic, rectangular, mid-century uh, modern uh, architecture of the Playboy design uh, apartments gave way to more extreme concepts of the, as the magazine started to appropriate uh, this is what they do next. They start to appropriate already existing houses and calling the, them Playboy uh, uh, parts. For example, they go to New Haven and they take Charles Moore uh, apartment. Uh, you have to remember that Charles, Charles Moore at that point was the dean of Yale uh, School of Architecture. And also, to make the thing a little bit more perverse, the man is gay, but nevertheless, Playboy or was gay. And the Playboy nevertheless appropriates his apartments and presented, presented this kind of uh, heterosexual kind of uh, uh, heaven with uh, uh, these women on the sauna and, and all of that. Or they appropriate, for example, the Futuro, uh, the Futuro <laughs> House of Mati Sarunen in, in, uh, in 1970, which of course they also present in all these kind of possible scenarios. You can bring it to the beach or you can bring it to, to, the, to a ski, etc. But they, the point is that they, they, they sexualize it, right? They, put, they, made, they bring all these people inside the space. And you have to see that even if some of those uh, projects were presented in architectural magazines, mo most of the time they were very dry, black and white uh, photographs. This is the Elrod House of uh, uh, Lodner, which also was appropriated by Playboy as one of the uh, uh, Playboy parts. This is 1971, and this is the house in, in Playboy. And here are some stills also of uh, James Bond. Uh, diamonds are uh, forever, because of course di uh, James Bond was incredibly also inspired uh, by uh, Playboy. Uh, and uh, in, in, in many ways follow, follow them in their choice of, uh, of architecture for the, for the setting. And of course, he play, uh, James Bond is also a member of the Playboy Club, so it's, uh, they reinforce uh, uh, each other. Apart from this, you can also see the, uh, the bubble house of, of Chrysalis in 1972. So you see, the, in the 70s, they become really cutting edge. I mean, this is, these are projects that most architectural magazines will have completely uh, dismissed. And, and how, how, who knows how uh, uh, Playboy even found out about uh, uh, them. But here you have Chrysalis and then the unfarm uh, house <laughs> of, the, of the century of 1973. Uh, uh, they again became a, a model of, uh, of seduction uh, uh, through uh, design. So it's no longer one or two carby designer chairs that prop up the comely uh, girl next door at the heart of the Playboy's uh, fantasy, but fully realized uh, buildings and interiors by leading uh, contemporary uh, experimental uh, architects that are shown filled with women that, as you can see, also seem to get more and more sophisticated. If you remember the first uh, images in the ranch-style house of California, they seem to get increasingly more sophisticated along with the architecture, as if design intensify and elevate the fantasy. Some, uh, here is again the unfarm. Some very high-profile architects, such as uh, Franjo Wright, uh, Miss Van der Rohe, Bucky Fuller, 
uh, were the subject of, uh, of features and interviews in the magazine as major cultural uh, figures, perfectly dressed and symptomatically celebrated for their masculine uh, sophistication with subtle uh, hints that they too are playboy. In the very first year, for example, you have Frank uh, your right, who was praised as an uncommon man who thumbs around in his jaguar, has a controversial uh, love life and radical, exciting uh, buildings. The architect becomes a model, carefully uh, posed at the very heart of the playboy fantasy. It is as if the architect dreams of the future, gets uh, uh, fused with a dream of sexual context. Here you have uh, Miss Slenderella uh, in the sky. Uh, of course, they start with Chicago, as I say, that's where Hefner is from. But then they move on to Bucky Fuller and start presenting all these uh, uh, projects of the city of the future. For example, 5,000 uh, living units in each of the three uh, uh, phases, each one with enough room for a garden, uh, etc. Not by chance does the magazine present the best, the, these vast uh, floating structures of, uh, of Fuller, uh, but also of uh, Moses Abdid. Uh, uh, habitat built for the Expo of 67 in Montreal as a fragment of a, of a possible city uh, of the future, or uh, Paolo Soleri, who died, I think, uh, even uh, only yesterday, uh, of the uh, uh, cathedral uh, cities for a new uh, society. Thousands of independent apartments, units are stuck up in a past uh, science fiction uh, form. The architect, er, architect stands at the edge of the future, visualizing the possible trajectory of design. The play, playboy never goes outside, but dreams of flying towards the future in his sealed uh, domestic uh, capsule. The playboy interior finally swallows uh, everything, including his own uh, future. And in the end, this continuously expanded world of design is itself a sexual fantasy, a space that the reader is skillfully seduced into. The more detailed the description, the more intensely the reader desires to get uh, in. To subscribe to Playboy is to get a set of a keys to a dream-like uh, world, a magical interior. With his, magic, with his uh, massive uh, uh, global uh, circulation uh, at its peak in 1972, Playboy sold more than 7 million copies. Can you imagine the million copies? How many readers is that? 20 million readers? 28 million readers? Probably more, right? So uh, one can argue uh, that Playboy had more uh, influence on the dissemination of modern uh, design than professional magazine, interior magazine, and even institutions like the Museum of Modern Art that, by the way, use similar tricks. I mean, if you think about the good design uh, exhibitions, they identify the ink there, but they also identify uh, the typewriter or the lamp or even the rear pod, and then they give you uh, uh, information about how much it costs and which department store uh, carries it. But I think that Playboy had much more uh, of an influence, and i give you just one quick example. If you think back to the 1972 uh, New Domestic Landscape Exhibition uh, at MoMA, this was a successful exhibition. Perhaps a, a few hundred uh, thousand people uh, visited. This is a big number uh, for MoMA. Compare it with the millions of readers that would have seen it uh, through um, uh, a Playboy magazine. And also, what are they looking at? I mean, in, at MoMA, you have seen this, which is kind of sexual enough, if you ask me, right? The Robert Mata, uh, uh, Roberto Mata Malite there, but in Playboy, you have that, right? Or in uh, MoMA, you have the uh, Arkithun Miss chair, but in Playboy, you have uh, this. You're not paying attention, right? Really paying attention. And all of a sudden, you know much more about the sign than most uh, actually sophisticated uh, uh, architects. Even the, playboy, the architects themselves seem to kind of assume this figure of the playboy, as when you look, for example, at this picture of uh, Eros Arinen and, and Charles Im uh, somewhere in Cranbrook, and the way that Eros is looking at, at this woman and the way they are dressed with their, their things. So they themselves assume uh, the figure of the uh, playboy. Um, and of course, designers uh, were readers too. If Playboy couldn't exist without architecture, it seems as if architecture culture couldn't exist uh, uh, without Playboy. And there are two sides of, of this. 
On the one hand, you have here uh, Gideon, who in the introduction to the fourth edition of his Space, Time, and Architecture, uh, in, uh, writes this uh, editorial called, or this preface called Architecture in the 1960s, Hopes and Fears, uh, where he talks about uh, this moment of certain confusion that exists in contemporary architecture as in painting a kind of pause, even a kind of exhaustion. Everyone is aware of its fatigue, is normally accompanied by uncertainty. What to do and where to go? Fatigue is the mother of indecision, opening the door to escapism, to superficiality of all kinds, right? And then uh, very soon he starts talking about uh, this romantic orgy by the 1960s, the result of this. Uh, fatigue uh, is uh, an escapism. His results could be uh, seen in a lace work of glittering details inside and outside, in the toothpick steels, an assembly of isolated buildings of the largest uh, culture. So he talks about the small breasted Gothic style uh, colleges, right? And then finally, a kind of playboy architecture is in vogue, an architecture treated as playboy street life, life, jumping from one sensation to another and quickly bored with everything. Of course, everybody pick up on this, right? And before we know, before he even published this introduction in the new edition of the book, there are all these articles that they directly call Siegfried Gideon on Playboy Architecture, in which the <laughs> appropriate fragments of this introduction appear. And it, it's translated in several languages. Here you have it in, in German. And of course, you can already imagine the kind of architecture that he is talking about, right, the architects of the Lincoln Center, they, he describes them as, 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 uh, as playboys, of course, uh, huge, huge stu stu students. Uh, uh, what is this building? The House of the Culture of the, of the World in, uh, in Berlin, or, or Robert Geddes, or uh, the pavilion in, uh, in Brussels in the, uh, of Edward Dar uh, Darrell Stone. Uh, in the, uh, well, this kind of architecture, Sarin and Gordon Bonsap, Yamasaki, those are the playboys uh, for Gideon, uh, definitely uh, uh, Sarin. Um, but there is also the other side, which is what appears with, uh, with Banham. So the magazine also uh, affected the imagination of critics uh, and architects. Reinhard Banham for example, wrote this uh, article in an architectural journal called I Will Crawl a Mile uh, for Playboy that captured precisely the sentiment of a whole new generation of, architect, uh, of architects. Because almost every architect was reading uh, Playboy, and Playboy insinuated itself into the fantasies of the field in ways that we need to explore, analyze, and critique. Here is the uh, Architects Journal, a very respectable journal, as you can see. And here is, uh, is uh, Banham with I Will Crawl a Mile for Playboy, where he says that, of course, I buy for the giant fold out color pinups Playboy Playmates, uh, one of oh, uh, <laughs> America's greatest gift to Western culture. And you know how I go for culture. But if I, wo I was a working hypocrite, I could find a dozen other reasons for keeping. Uh, a breast of, uh, of Playboy, item architecture and interior design. I will repeat that to show I'm not kidding, architecture and interior design. So this is the incredible thing. I found that much later, after I have done most of the research on, on, uh, on Playboy, uh, somebody pointed to me to this article and I went and I, and I thought to myself, so he already told us. He already, in this article in 1960, was saying, I repeat, architecture and interior design. He was a careful reader of the magazine. He knew uh, that there was a lot of architecture there, but we have uh, 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 neglected it. As I say, this um, Playboy uh, insinuated itself into this, or captured this uh, whole uh, generation. I mean, he, Banham wrote a let, letter to Playboy, I mean, like, no, he, he was always on top of, on, on top of it. So uh, it's not by chance in that sense that Archie Grant had a Playboy in their survival kit of 1963. Playboy is, of course, a product of the Cold War, something that we haven't talked about it yet, but it's already evident in the very first issue of the uh, magazine where Hefner uh, wrote that Playboy uh, was offered as a kind of diversion 
for, from the anxieties of the atomic uh, age. So it's not an accident that it appears in this survival uh, key. Here are a few of the architects of that generation uh, influenced by Playboy. Hans Kolein is one of them. I mean, Hans Kolein it was very interesting when we were interviewing him for the Klippestand Paul um, exhibition. We were talking about this magazine, Bao, who used to be, which used to be a really boring uh, a, a journal of the Society of Architectural uh, Architects of, of Austria. And one day, in one of these cocktail scenes, he told the director what the same this magazine was, and uh, he said, "Why don't you do it?" And so uh, uh, Holine end up, ends up doing this unbelievable series of uh, of uh, of uh, bows in which you can see clearly the influence of Playboy. But I didn't know that either. At that time, we were interviewing him, and he was talking about how one of the first issues was on, I think, Melnikov, and how they have gone to uh, the Soviet Union, or how difficult things were at that time. And you know, uh, in the end, he realized he was not going to be able to reproduce the, the photographs of Melnikov uh, in Moscow, and that the easiest way would be to put all the photographs and all the material in a suitcase and take it to Vienna, and then come back to, to Moscow. And he's telling me all this story, and I'm already there, you know, in these Cold War uh, years. And, and he's talking about how he came back, and, and the uh, guards uh, gave him such a hard time, and then confiscated, and I was, <gasps> they confiscated the photographs of Melnikov. And, and no, he says, he, they confiscated my Playboys. And uh, as, <laughs> after all this building up of the material of Melnikov, I was having a heart attack that the Melnikov material would have been destroyed because of him and trained to bring it to Vienna. I was kind of anticipating all this disaster. And they confiscated your what? And they confiscated his playboys. Of course, that generation was going around with their playboys, and it's clearly obvious uh, in their uh, work, as is also in the, uh, in the work of, of Banham. But we were on this question of the Cold War, uh, that, as I say, in the first editorial, Hefner already wrote that Playboy was offered as a kind of diversion from the anxieties of the atomic uh, uh, age. Uh, the magazine uh, or the Playmates line up uh, uh, the interior walls of concert huts uh, in the Korean War and, uh, and in the Vietnam uh, War. And Playboy was featured in films such as Doctor Strange. Uh, there are also cartoons. But I'm sure it was only thunder, Mr. Mr. Putnam, right? So the whole Cold War is there. If we attack Mrs. Jennings, there is room in my shelter for you, but not for other neighbors, right? Uh, and as I say, it appears also lying in the, the uh, it is, appears also in films such as Doctor Strange Love of 1964 or Apocalypse uh, uh, Now. Now, uh, in conclusion then, uh, from the furniture to the clothes to the lighting, the music, the food, the drinks, the conversations, the jokes, the ideas, the art, the architecture, the smells, and even the, the way to move, to act, everything was provided in Playboy. The magazine, in a way, created a total uh, work of art. When you open the pages of the magazine, you are invited to dive into this world without gaps, without cracks, without decay, an infinite, uh, perfected uh, interior, a kind of total uh, uh, work of art. And here are some images of the exhibition that we put together at the NIE in Maastricht. It's a huge space. There were like 600 square meters, like 6,000 square feet of space. And they were very keen that the exhibition will not be two-dimensional. This is what normally happens with uh, exhibitions of magazines, right? So we build this, uh, these kind of uh, bookcases. Uh, where you have all the magazines and, and you could actually hand them, you could touch them, you could have, you have to put gloves, but you can have. And then we came up with the idea of having these uh, bunny ears that indicate every time there is uh, anything having to do with architecture or design in the magazine. So imagine, did you see that word? Uh, how many uh, ears there are? So practically there is no issue in which there is no architecture or design in the magazine. So that shows the extent of, uh, of, the, uh, of the influence. And, uh, and it has, of course, it has depth, and you can see through different layers of uh, people. Uh, uh, uh. This uh, was uh, an area that we call the, ma the making of, of the magazine, and it was all having to do with how you put the magazine together on the, 
uh, ceiling is the photograph of Hefner on the bed that is then reflected in the, in the mirror, uh, mirror surfaces. And they were all the documents that have to do with the making of the magazine, the files, for example, you see these photographs with the files of the topics, everything that has to do, correspondence, having to do with the making of the magazine uh, was there. This area was dedicated to the city because the city was important, very important to Playboy. The Playboy is an urban uh, 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 man. It is uh, reacting precisely against this, what they call the suburbanization of America. They, uh, they defend the city and they are uh, projects of uh, ideal cities of the future, but they are also dealing uh, with Chicago and, and with uh, existing cities. This is the upper uh, part of uh, the NIE where there were again a number of uh, environments, including the one dedicated to the Playboy pad, and this is the model of the Playboy townhouse, and an area still with a rectangular bed where you could watch all these things and people could lie in the bed, and all the documentation of the Playboy pad is there. Um, then we uh, created this concert hut where all the uh, uh, material that has to do with the war uh, is included. Uh, uh, the big bunny and all the vehicles are in this uh, section. The grotto, which I haven't talked about, but is hugely important uh, uh, in Playboy. And also there were a lot of uh, videos, so there was this kind of uh, uh, reconstructed kind of uh, a sketch of a, of a grotto, which included a pool and some smells of chlorine and so, and, and then films of the, on the grotto. The closet, because of course they are recommending constantly that you buy all this stuff, but where does all this stuff go? In the end, so, you know, this was uh, part of the thing. I don't have pictures of everything. Here are the, the, the chairs and the way they were presented in the, in the magazine. And uh, uh, finally, uh, the control room, which is all dedicated to the question of surveillance in Playboy. But also you realize at the end of the exhibition that you have been yourself surveyed throughout the whole uh, exhibition. And that is, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. You have some questions? I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Cosmopolitan existed uh, during those years, and I, it's also very interesting that they have uh, is it, is dedicated to the to 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 the single women too. They defended the single woman. They were also in favor of uh, of the urban uh, girl. They have no interest in modern architecture and design. Uh, also, the economics are important here. The uh, bachelor uh, men uh, uh, in this uh, uh, period has a lot of disposable income. Uh, the uh, women is not the same. Uh, the unmarried woman is not the same. They may be working as secretaries or whatever. They are living in the city. That's what Cosmopolitan is telling them. That's what the action is. They are uh, very liberal in the sense that, uh, what's the name of the, she died recently, the editor of, of uh, Cosmopolitan encourage. Uh, it's part of, the whole thing is part of the sexual revolution, encourage them to, hmm? Yeah, yeah, right. And if you, you see, you remember, and uh, the, um, she, they, she, she did, there was some advice on how to decorate your apartment and so, but it would be more like you can find this uh, in a market or you can go, you know, show your pieces and uh, that you could put together, but there is nothing of the intensity of modern architecture and design that is char characteristic of uh, Playboy. Playboy was the first one to really uh, capitalize on that, which is really interesting because, you know, if Playboy cannot exist without modern architecture, right, what does modern architecture do here, right? I mean, it's, it's incredibly fascinating, I think. Uh, Latin American uh, uh, architecture, the modern, the historiography of modern architecture in Latin America, 
which believe it or not is not uh, uh, is not well studied. So without being in in yeah? you did no no <laughs> and radical pedagogy radical pedagogy is a project that we started two years ago and uh, and now uh, is already kind of uh, uh, starting. We are starting to come out with uh, material for this. Radical pedagogy looks at all the experiments in pedagogy in the post-war uh, years, right? I mean, the usual uh, suspects are the AEA, uh, the Cooper Union, the Institute, etc. Uh, but uh, we found a lot of really unbelievable uh, experiments that are not so well known, like the Valparaiso School in Chile or other experiments in Latin America. So the a school of design in India where the IMS were involved. So it's a global phenomenon uh, that goes from Ulm and uh, the experiments of uh, Archithum with global tools in, uh, in Florence to, uh, to, to many different parts of, of the world. So I think this is uh, an important project as well uh, because in many ways what we are doing in pedagogy right now is still based on, the, on what was uh, started in those years, the revolution that uh, uh, these programs represented, like the AA, for example. We are still, in a way, uh, working with these same, very same models, but we probably are on the verge of a, of a radical transformation in the ways in which we, we teach. So we did that as a kind of uh, preparation, since most uh, students in the PhD program end up going to work in a... Uh, uh, teaching. I mean, I thought it was very important to have a sense of the history of the uh, experimentation in pedagogy. Do you think that Right. I mean, I think it's always sexual. I mean, if, if you ask me, I mean, I think if you look at the photographs of, uh, uh, of the Chaise Long of, of, uh, of Le Corbusier uh, and the way they were represented, there is already some uh, uh, sexuality uh, clearly uh, uh, there. You can talk about, uh, obviously, the objectification, objectification of women in Playboy, and that's not... Uh, 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 debatable, I think it's, uh, it's clear. But at the same time, I don't know whether you noticed some of the topics uh, uh, that were uh, being treated by the, the magazine. The magazine was progressive in other, in other wars. They, they were uh, in favor of the pill at a time, you know, still in this country, many people still think that that's problematic, right? Uh, they were in favor of uh, w women liberation, whatever they understood by, by this, but they were in favor of this, and uh, likewise, they were also in favor of uh, of modern architecture. There is something, if you think about the chair, in and chair, for example, what is first? Is it mm, is it uh, Playboy sexualizing the chair in and chair, or is the chair in and chair already sexual? Right? I mean, it's very interesting to looking at the advertisements of the chair in and chair chair uh, uh, that they are already naked. Uh, women in that chair before Playboy, right? And the prototype was done in what? Uh, Ambon, what did he describe the material? Ambon cow or something like, I mean, like... Uh, Ambon calf. Ambon calf, Ambon calf. The, the skin of an Ambon calf, I mean, like, how, how did he come up with that one, right? And then there is a naked body in, the, in one of those advertisements, so you wonder who gave the idea first, right? Um, Likewise, I think if you talk about, uh, if you go back to Le Corbusier, one second. You, in the Spring Nouveau Pavilion, for example, he, what? Not that many people said one second. Sorry, sorry. Ah, <laughs> no, I was, th I was thinking about the El Spring Nouveau Pav Pavilion in, in 1925 for Le Corbusier. He describes it also as the, um, uh, as the, as the space for, a, as the apartment for a bachelor. So these fantasies of the, of the bachelor associated with modern architecture, if we go back to look at modern architecture, they may, may be already there, you know? Anyway. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
But going back to your question, I mean, other uh, ideas that come to mind is, for example, when you think about Adolf Loos and his fantasies of the Josephine Baker house that I brought here at a certain point in relation to, to the house, the, the townhouse of, uh, of Hefner. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine that he didn't know about this, this house because it's so many uh, references. And again, it's the fantasy of an architect like Adolf Loos. Nobody had commissioned him to do this house for Josephine Baker. But he fantasized this whole kind of scenario in which uh, Josephine will be in this modern uh, house uh, swimming in these crystalline uh, waters that you can see through the corridors that surround uh, uh, the pool. So I, I think it's a very good question in the end because, in fact, one could rewrite or reread uh, the history of modern architecture and see whether this is already uh, uh, there. Oh my God, so we have to get out of here. <laughs>